Hello, everybody. Again on Zoom. Hi. Um, everybody doing good? I know I I've had a fun two weeks with KSA and finals, but we're making it through. <laughs> Not many of y'all have to deal with that, but I do. So <laughs> ready to get into a very vibrant meeting today. Right. I think Sarah's next with. Yeah, we'll, we'll just kick things off with attendance. Uh, no folks are, as you mentioned, Justin, really busy um, wrapping up their school year. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll do a quick roll call and then um, just review kind of our last orders of business from the convening. And Karen will give us a recap, um, I believe. Everyone was able to join us in person, but we'll just kind of refresh our memory since we were so much younger back then. And we'll move forward with <laughs> Alfonso. I was, uh, we're young, right? Let's be there with me in this. Uh, <laughs> and we'll move on into uh, doing the good work. So um, I am here, Karen Perry, Justin, here. Yeah. Uh, Nisha, Nisha. All right, Rachel Albright. I'm here. Thank you. Danette Baker. Radar Barnes. Penny Christian. Susan Sintra. Robin Cochran. Carmen Coleman. Carmen, I got you. I know you're driving. I'm here. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> uh, Alfonso de Torres Nunez. See. Si. And Damat. Elizabeth Dinkins. We need to uh, yeah, adjust our form there. Susan Dougal. Rayma Dutt. Holly Elmore. I'm here. Thank you. Travis Hamby. Here. Thank you, Amy Harris. Mike Hesketh. Rhea Eisenberg. Here, sorry, I had a question from a staff member. You're fine, thank you. Soyana Mesfin. Julie Monarch. Jordan Pack. Karen Scheiding. Rob Smith, Rashawn West, and Carrie Wilkerson. All right. No uh, Sarah, we are also joined by Sandy students. Yes. Hello. And I see uh, Lynn. I did not call your name, I don't believe, but we've got I'm here. Got you on here. All right, thank you so much. We will work on your access now to that agenda. And before we move on to um, take a look at that agenda for the night, we are needing um, someone to serve in that secretary capacity. Um, Rhea, I recognize that you stepped up to the plate to do that for us in our in-person convening for the Cool Council. Um, offer that up to you now to continue in that role or would you like to pass that on to someone? I have started taking notes. Um, I don't care if someone else would like to do that. It does not matter to me. Uh, I don't, I can't see the agenda, but I'm okay with not seeing it until I have access. So whatever that works best for everyone. Right. I just shared that with you and sharing the meeting notes document as well, if you don't mind to just record in that official space. Um, and we'll use that just as a share back out to the group after our meeting tonight to make sure that um, actions were noted as everyone wishes for them to be represented publicly. So I'm gonna give that to you, Rhea, in a private message just so you have it. <clears throat> I just dropped the link in, back in the chat again in case we had anyone um, just join. And I do believe, Sarah, we just had Robin Cochran just join um, if you want to adjust the attendance. Thank you. 
All right, so um, as far as reviewing minutes for our last meeting, our um, kind of big to do an item that we left off as a group from the in-person convening was to have our uh, BHAG for the next six months. Um, and so we'll just kind of remind folks of where we landed as a committee. And I will have that here on our screen in just a second. Apologize for that. My computer was trying to take a nap on a warm Monday I afternoon. <laughs> I got you, Sarah. It's right here. Thank you. So our uh, BHAG for the next six months where we left off together was to develop a draft of a public facing collection of examples of vibrant learning experiences from across Kentucky in alignment with our commitment of shining through sharing. And we said that we would do this by prioritizing simple shifts and entry points of the LE, evidence of the LE, and a map of where those vibrant learning experiences are happening. Um, so if we could just kind of get a um, consensus from the group that this is still after some reflection where we uh, feel comfortable pursuing going forward. Let's just do um, our quick fist to five protocol um, just to make sure that folks still feel good about that next six month BHAG from our previous convening. So you can either put your five or your number, whatever your number is, on the screen using your camera, um, or you can drop it into the chat, whatever is easiest for you. <clears throat> and as a reminder, fist to five, five is total agreement. I am passionate about moving forward with this decision, um, ranking all the way down into a fist, which would be a zero, signifying that you do not feel comfortable moving on in support. Yeah. Alfonso makes me want to give my answer in French, which I took in high school, but I can't remember the number for five in French. So, sink? Sink, I think. Yep. I was doing it in my head. And the trois. All right. Thank you very much. It looks like we are in agreement to move on um, still with that BHAG, so thank you for that. And I'm gonna pass over to Karen for just a quick recap um, of what got us to the point of determining this next goal for six months. Okay, um, before we do that, I really wanna apologize to you all. I put this in the calendar hold, but I really thought I had sent this calendar hold to you all last week um, using the um, listserv email address. And I realized last night that I wasn't getting any acceptances. And so this is the agreed upon time and I'm glad you all wrote it down in your calendars when we were together. But um, I now realize that the way I tried to send the calendar hold did not go through to you. So I really apologize for what was kind of a last Last minute invitation. Um, but I'm glad you're all here. Uh, we definitely have a lot of good and important work to do. Um, excited to see you all um, here today. So just to take us back to um, um, the, the convening on April 25th and 26th, I just want to run through a few kind of highlights from our days together uh, just to remind us where we left off. Uh, and I think that will frame our work moving forward. Um, the first thing we did was we were reminded of our moonshot challenge by um, Commissioner Glass and um, Board Chair Young um, reminded us of the, the ambitious nature of this task and uh, reminded us that is a worthy pursuit. Um, and so appreciated the inspiration um, there from, um, from the two of them and um, our interim chair, of course, Audrey Gilbert as well. Uh, we had a, a discussion in the room about uh, prioritizing portrait of a learner. Um, I think we left that initial conversation without really having um, a firm commitment from the room, but I think um, it did give us a, a, a jumping point uh, to have some good conversations in our standing committees about prioritizing the statewide portrait of a learner and what is our commitment to helping operationalize that portrait of a learner across the state. 
We then, if you'll remember, learned from three different panels. There was a panel uh, representing each one of the standing committees. Um, and so um, there was a, a mixed set of folks on there. We had students, we had parents, we had um, school people, we had community people um, who were talking about um, just various questions based on the standing committees, um, areas of inquiry and work uh, thus far. And then if you remember, they went out into the audience and got each got a person to come back and participate in the panel to sort of widen out the discussion um, even further. We spent a fair amount of time in standing committee uh, work, and I'm going to recap that for us just to, and then just a second. Um, and then um, we had a standing committee share out. You remember we gave a presentation, each one of the standing committees gave a presentation about our work to date, our next BHAG, and um, our next set of work, uh, how we're gonna pursue our next BHAG. Um, there was an announcement of our, um, of our elected chair, who is Audrey Gilbert. So she'll be moving from interim chair to um, chair of uh, the, of the um, Kentucky and How Do We Learn team, um, and vice chair is Sarah Hatton uh, from Adair County. And so, and then after that, we had some closing reflections for the day um, and wrapped up two good days of work together. Um, am I forgetting anything big? Um, anything else that stood out from folks? <clears throat> um, I wanted to also recap what we did um, as a as a standing committee, I think we did a lot of good work together over those two days. Um, just as um, as a reminder, we did um, have a volunteer for our learning witness. Thank you, Rhea um, Eisenberg, who has agreed to um, to serve in that role. For now, we revisited what our purpose is as Vibrant Learning, uh, which is to support local communities in transforming the student learning experience, um, particularly with regard to the PBL efforts, the deeper learning efforts, the L3 efforts, um, and other innovative efforts um, that are happening across the, the Commonwealth. This was our initial BHAG, if you remember. We said we wanted to spend our first six months or so just developing an internal shared understanding about what learning matters to students. Um, and I want to thank our chair, Justin, for the important inclusion of that, that phrase that matters to students um, so we can help articulate a vision and plan uh, to create excitement about the future of education. So by way of working on that learning agenda, we created a learning playlist. We had a presentation from the Canopy Project. We had some uh, Marshall County presentations. We went on a site visit to Eminence, if you recall, um, and then we um, did some individual learning reflection um, work as well. So the next couple of slides are really just kind of a reminder of what these things were. Here's our playlist and then a little bit of um, evidence from a Marshall County visit, a little bit of evidence from our eminence visit, um, some reminders of the Canopy Project for us. Um, and then we proposed that we were gonna spend our two working days together um, in some smaller working groups um, to tackle our next BHAG, which um, Sarah has already reminded us of what our next BHAG is. But um, let me, before we move to the next BHAG, let me recap our previous BHAG. So our previous v BHAG was to develop an internal shared understanding. Um, and our outcome from all of that work um, is here is our definition of vibrant learning. Um, the tagline, learning that matters, I think is still sticking um, with us. Um, but uh, the broader definition um, as agents of their own learning, students cognitively engaged in relevant, authentic, meaningful education, discovering gifts and talents, which culminate into personalized products and experiences that demonstrate their mastery of knowledge and skills. Um, so our BHAG was to define it and come to an internal shared understanding. Um, and so I, I think having done that, um, we did actually develop an even longer uh, explanation of what um, vibrant learning is, just to give people sort of more information about what we're really talking about. It's broad, right? The, the, the definition and the understanding of vibrant learning is that it's a, a broad set of experiences, but there are some key anchor 
um, characteriz characteristics of it, um, which include things like authentic, irrelevant context, real world problems, challenges that require creative solutions, personalized, self-directed learning. So each student's demonstrating agency um, according to their own interests and goals. And at the end, there's a demonstration of mastery of knowledge and skills um, through products um, that are really um, intended to go out into the world and mean something uh, to kids and to the to the communities they serve. Um, and so this is our, our shared sense of what vibrant learning is. Um, and so I think this was a good six months worth of work for us. So here's where we are thus far. Um, as we've already talked about, we did identify our next BHAG, um, which is um, now that we have a shared internal sense of what vibrant learning is, we want to look more um, outward um, to develop a sense of vibrant learning that we can share more widely uh, with folks. And so our BHAG for the next six months, give or take five or six months, um, is to develop um, some public facing artifacts to share with folks, some examples examples, some um, I'll just know it when I see it kind of work uh, to share more broadly with people in three subgroups. Um, an articulation of how folks can get started with simple shifts and entry points into vibrant learning, um, some evidence of what it looks like when you see it, um, and a map of where it's happening. And so this is us putting some meat on the bones um, beyond the definition, but really starting to talk about what it looks like when it comes to life. And the good, good news for us in Kentucky is that there's lots of vibrant learning happening. We've already seen um, part of our job is to hold it up and share uh, that. So that's really um, the, the commitment that we have there, which is shining through sharing. We want to hold things up that are amazing. Um, we want to share those things. We want to get other people sharing those things um, so that vibrant learning can spread across the Commonwealth and all these bright lights can begin to connect with one another. So um, that's a recap of our two days um, in April and also a forecasting of our work uh, together. Um, the last thing we didn't really get much of an opportunity to talk about, um, we just sort of ran out of work time um, during our April days, but I would like us to um, maybe reconsider this question, how we really want to work with other committees. We've we've said that we're clear that we like to work with other committees, um, but um, we, we, I think, can be strategic and specific and intentional about that effort, and it would be good, I think, to talk about that um, in the pretty near future. Other committees, of course, have their own BHAGs, um, but they, uh, a number of them have expressed interest in working with vibrant learning as well. We did a little bit of that when we shared the, um, the school site visit together, but it would be good, I think, to, to continue to be intentional about those efforts. So to that end, um, um, one of the things we thought would be easy to do would be in, to invite someone um, from each of the other standing committees to join us. And so tonight we're joined by Sandy Student um, from the Accelerating Innovation Standing Committee. Um, Sandy, did you want to share anything with, um, with Vibrant Learning just by way of quickly maybe saying what AI is working on in the next couple of months or so? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, thanks for having me and, and excited to be here. Um, and I think I can, I think the thing that makes sense for me to update everyone on is just kind of where the AI standing committee is at. Uh, we have not figured out a BHAG yet, but we're close. Uh, so our committee is currently voting on one and the polls close tomorrow. But based on the last meeting that we had, I think uh, I, I can share the likely one and I'll, I'll read it verbatim and then I'll also do a shortened version because it's a little bit wordy. So. Verbatim, it's define and compare multiple possible models for a future assessment and accountability system that takes into account our lessons learned from our report and meets our design principles. This would include exploring opportunities and trade-offs within local, state, and federal contexts. And in more kind of plain language, this is essentially going to consist of taking what we learned from the report that our committee put together over the last six months to generate three prototype assessment and accountability models that envision potential futures for assessment and accountability in Kentucky. And these three prototypes will be differentiated by the nature of control. So one model will be fully local control. 
One will be local with state support and one will be a state centralized model. And the goal will be to get to the point that we can compare and contrast kind of the, the limitations and affordances of, of all three of these models. And um, certainly the, the profile of a learner will be something that we consider in the process of this, but it, it is, it sounds like somewhat similar to your BHAG broader than just the profile of a learner. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. And, and uh, so first of all, super um, helpful. I want to open the floor for any questions that you might have about the, the BHAG from AI. <clears throat> Um, it, it sounds Sandy, like y'all are going to embark on another, um, journey about sort of learning what else is out there. Um, and you know, um, I wonder what the opportunity is for us to, um, continue working together. We can, um, we'd love to send a representative to your meetings. Um, and just like, uh, we, we did, um, last week, um, and we'd love for y'all to keep coming to ours. Um, but, um, you know, I feel like let's, let's keep talking about how we can, um, you know, go on site visits together, or as you all are learning things about um, these different models, um, you know, how can vibrant learning contribute to, um, you know, making, you know, more evidence of learning happen that's, that's helpful, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, thank you for that reminder, Sarah. Yeah, AI accelerating innovation um, through change in assessment and accountability. Not the, uh, the very, fan, not the exciting AI that everyone's no. talking not the new AI. You guys were before that AI. No, maybe not. Same. Yeah, um, we, I, I think it, it's safe to say that the accelerating innovation folks feel similarly and continuing to collaborate where possible would be uh, really appealing. So I'll, I'll forward that sentiment on to the folks there and hopefully that'll yeah. continue to happen. So to that end, vibrant learning, one of the things we're going to ask is if there's anyone who's interested in attending uh, any of the AI standing meetings, um, which uh, we are working to not schedule on top of each other. So we bumped ours to this week because they were last week. So um, when we get their next um, meeting date, do you already know what that is offhand, Sandy, by any chance? I don't off the top of my head. No, I'm okay. sorry. When we get it, we'll send it out to everyone and ask for anyone who'd like to volunteer to attend um, just to start building some bridges between the standing committees. Um, at a minimum, we can commit to the chairs and the facilitators talking, but I think it would be great to have other folks um, to, to, you know, to the maximum extent possible um, to participate in, um, in, in doing some of that bridge building over to the other committees. Um, so, uh, I think Sandy, your intention is to hang out with us tonight and, um, uh, float around. We'd love to have you. We're super glad you're here. Um, and our plan for tonight is to spend a fair amount of time um, back in our work groups because, um, although our work subgroups got started, um, at the April convening, I think we didn't quite get finished with our work. And so our plan is to spend some time here working in our subgroups again. So you're welcome to join any of them um, that makes sense to you. Um, Sarah, are you missing folks from your subgroup? I am. I think Justin was going to propose some options for the group to consider on how they want to work together tonight. Okay. With lower attendance. So we don't have that many people here. So the subgroups are kind of a little smaller. So we can either, A, we can... Um, stay as a whole group and kind of go over each subgroup and throw in any suggestions we have for each subgroup. We can B, um, go ahead and go into the breakouts. And if anybody is without a group or their group is not present, they can join another group. So it is, it's ultimately up to y'all by vote. So A is stay as a full group, B is go into breakouts, and continue on. Is that right? Those are our options? Correct. Yep. And just as a reminder, these are those work groups from our final day together. So several of you had started talking about the map. Some of you had been working in the evidence, the types of evidence we're looking for, and then others were working on those simple shifts. And some of you may not have been there on day two, so you may be looking for a home as well. Anyone feel strongly about those options? Do you want me to vote in the chat? 
yeah, that'll be good. Let's just send in the chat, breakout or whole group, and we'll go from there. Is that okay? Oh. I think we have a majority whole group coming in, Justin. All right, and that's what we'll do. We'll stay as a whole group. So if each group, how do we want to do this? Does each group want to like give an overview of what they talked about at the in-person cool convening? And then we can have a discussion surrounding that group and then move on and hit all three groups. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to recap, especially for the folks who weren't there for the other parts of it to sort of recap what each group did. Yeah. <clears throat> Who wants to start? Karen, I can kick things off. One is the lone map group member, but also because I think the other two groups really inform what happens in the map. So just to kind of create a, a lens and frame for folks as we work together this evening. Um, so I was able to work with Carrie and Penny um, when we were last together, and we were talking about a dashboard approach very similar to the Canopy project, um, looking to create some sort of interactive one-stop shop for information uh, with really this regional approach um, so that schools can more easily connect to examples in their region um, as neighbors. Um, we talked about how districts are really responsive to their co-ops and that the deeper learning work in those co-ops may uh, give us a really great avenue to collect some responses as well. So looking to create some sort of map, again, similar to the work that um, Transcend has put into the Canopy project, we felt like there were some very um, key kind of grain sizes that we wanted to work towards. Um, hoping to get at the school level. So how do we identify a school where vibrant learning is happening and identify the key shifts that they've used to transform the student learning experience? What are those key practices that they feel are key to vibrant learning or that we've decided in our definition? Um, and how do we identify schools through those practices? And we felt that it was a very big deal to lift up within that school grain size, teacher models and exemplars. Um, so including a video example of a teacher uh, who is implementing that uh, key shift in practice and tagging them within that school profile. Um, information that we felt was important to collect as well were school demographics. Um, and what were their entry points? So again, informed by the work that other uh, work groups were doing. We imagine the audience for this tool is primarily educators um, and also thought that families would be a key audience if linked to district sites. Um, and we are thinking about, again, an emphasis on teacher examples, um, including uh, reflections when possible and really wanting to em emphasize a space to capture perhaps anonymous student quotes about that learning experience. Um, and then what we were wrestling with was the relevance of portrait alignment. So if a district, uh, if a school is within a district that utilizes a local portrait of a graduate, is that something to be featured uh, on this dashboard as well? So we saw that um, through the other group's work of identifying um, evidence, what, how do we know when we see it? Obviously, that would help us create some sort of tool for nomination or for self-reporting. And then we also hoped that the other group focused on key shifts um, and practices could help inform uh, what it is that schools identify um, as their entry points and key practices so that when we create this database of schools where vibrant learning is happening, we can uh, lift up those key shifts and tags so that folks can connect and learn from other schools who are um, doing this work. 
Um, super helpful reminder, um, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wonder if the fuller group, given that your subgroup is um, is missing some key people here tonight, I wonder if this fuller group could have a little bit of discussion about your question that you are wrestling with, which was, what is the degree to which the portrait of a learner should kind of drive this? Um, curious to hear what folks um, have to say about the portrait of a learner being an important integral or driving part of this um, dashboard. And I heard you call it portrait of a graduate. Is that, can that be interchanged with portrait of a learner? Is that considered the same thing? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. That is a um, really sort of, some folks call it portrait of a learner. Some folks call it portrait of a graduate. Some folks um, call it a profile of a graduate. All of those things are interchangeable. Some creative districts, um, what are you calling it down in Allen County? Travis Hammy is a portrait of a patriot. Is that right? Profile of a patriot. Profile, profile of a patriot, yeah. Um, so yes, they're all interchangeable. Oh, sorry, I switch in and out and sorry. <clears throat> so do we want to prioritize that on our dashboard? And if so, how might we do that? I feel like it's hard. Like, which one do we prioritize, though? Do we prioritize the states? Because, like, my district doesn't have one, but I know, like, Travis comes from an amazing district that does have a very nice one. So, like, do you put theirs on the dashboard, what their portrait of a learner is and how they're meeting it? Do you put the states on there? What about schools that don't have one or don't adopt one? Mm -hmm. I would think that if a district and I don't know much about how it looks, um, but at a district level, that don't theirs have to would think would have to fit within the state model somehow. So I would I mean, I would think the most the easiest way to show that might be the state. Is it six? There are six categories, right? I don't have don't have the paperwork in front of me. I apologize. But um, so I would think you, you would go with those and then somehow have those highlighted somehow or as a you know as it were so that it could it could be broken down that way and I just could fit in multiple categories as well so I'm pulling I'm trying to pull up the state one now just for quick reference um and um, share that with folks, um, but you are right. It, there's a lot of crossover between the state version and the local versions. I don't know, it's a little bit hard, probably a little bit hard to see there, um, but the Kentucky Portrait of a Learner has these characteristics, um, engaged citizen, critical thinker, effective communicator, empowered learner, let me, get a little bit bigger here. Um, uh, empowered learner, creative contributor, and productive collaborator. Our sense of it, and I, we haven't really done any formal study of this, this might be an interesting thing for maybe um, AI and vibrant learning to undertake as a joint effort to really, really uh, cross walk the local portraits that have been created and the state one um, to see what the overlap is between the locals and the, and the states. My sense of it is there's a ton of overlap. There's not a whole lot that the local districts have articulated that's way outside the bounds of what is articulated here, although it might be um, sliced in slightly different ways or it might have different descriptors on it. Um, you know, some folks are saying empowered learner, some folks may say resilient learner, um, or resourceful learner or something like that. So, um, some variation, but lots and lots of overlap. Um, but, but we haven't done any formal, uh, analysis of that. Um, but it might be a worthy pursuit for us to do that. Aaron, just adding there, if the alignment seems kind of uncanny, I think it's, uh, nice to remember that it's because about 10 districts who had existing portraits came together to help craft this state one. So 
if that seems like there's a close alignment to many local portraits, it's very much by design. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. This was largely informed by the locals that were out first. Um, so it's a good point. Just lifting up, Rachel, I see your comment um, with a spotty internet. I can appreciate that fully. She was emphasizing an option to feature local portraits um, just to have that their own flavor um, and kind of distinction of those local portraits in comparison to only the state. Mm -hmm. So what this might look like for a map, for the map, the implications of this in the map might be, hey, if you want someone who really is just rocking it on engaged citizen and fostering that and measuring that and got strong evidence of that and would have something worthy of sharing with other people on engaged citizen, this could be something we could tag them with on the map, right? Is that the way you're envisioning it? Or any of these um, I don't know. Can you guys hear me at all? My internet is really terrible. Am I breaking up? We hear you. We hear you. Okay. Um, I would say in in my work this year, I, we we actually started with that idea of of like um, kind of taking these competencies and trying to use those as like a way to like categorize things. And what we found is it's actually really hard to point to something and say, that's a great example of engaged citizen. Cause as you really dig into something, you're like, Oh, but like the reason that is looking like such a great example of engaged citizen is they're also being productive collaborators and creative contributors. And like, it's really hard to like parse them apart by like the competencies because like vibrant learning is vibrant because it's it's a lot of these things all together at once so i would just say like that might be one caution is it, it's really difficult to parse vibrant learning apart by these um competencies mm -hmm. rachel right. what that just made me think um and and this is a question i think for the group specifically diving into entry points and key shifts is the portrait of a learner itself an indicator of vibrant learning that we would tag. So it may not exist across all examples and contexts on the map, but does that become a shift to more vibrant learning experiences in those communities? Sarah, you know what? Um, we might have lost Rachel. I don't know. I know what what I think she would say and what I would say is, yes, when you see that a school or a district is broadening their definition of student success beyond solely academics, then I think that's a really good sign. The, the point that I think that one of the things we've talked about that Rachel mentioned is that, I mean, you you could, yeah, because the point is we don't want teachers saying this experience makes is going to make you a more effective communicator. I, please reflect on what we want is for the kids to understand those competencies so well that they can then speak to um, which of those was most impactful for them during whatever learning experience. So if we if we categorize them like that, what I would think we'd want to do is hear from capture some stories from students who could speak to those. Does that even make sense? It may not. Yeah, I yeah, I love capturing, capturing about which of these are um, most powerful to them and what their own evidence is and why they think they're an effective collaborator or whichever one they choose. I I love the idea of that. Alfonso, I see your hand raised. Hi. Um. All right, so there are thoughts in my head about this. Um, the first one, and it's kind of a word of caution, uh, we 
I, I think that we should be very careful about how we present this to the other groups and also how we worry about this, because the last thing that we want this for this portrait of a learner to become is a checklist where um, where either school districts or even students, and they go, they check the list as in this, 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 this is what I do, this I do, damn, I'm good to go. Um, so I think that we should be cautious about this uh, because every well-intentioned tool that has been put out there in the recent past, it has always been well-intentioned, but uh, because of lack of knowledge, of lack of explanation, or lack of, or even lack of practice, or lack of understanding, it has turned out to be that checklist that we don't want this to be, because as we have said several times, this is a very good, great opportunity that we have to, to uh, for the moonshot, right? And, uh, and and we should he that we should keep that in mind whenever we are having these conversations. Uh, connecting that to what Carmen was mentioning before, in my mind, uh, and I'm saying this because I'm seeing right now my fifth graders having this type of conversations about their uh, global backpacks, um, about backpack of, of success skills. Um, more than just what is it that you have learned. It's more about what is the ultimate goal of that learn of that vibrant learning experience that you have gone through. So it's not just attainment of the skills, rather, uh, what is the main driver of that process that you have gone through? It has whichever vibrant learning experience that you have been engaging in is was that through the lens of engaged citizen, through was that through the lens of critical thinker, was that through the lens of effective communicators, uh, kind of like an umbrella term that that um, that uh, embraces all of the other things that we had mentioned before in our definition for for vibrant learning experiences, right? Uh, kind of like. There was something that Carmen said before, but I, it, I lost it. It's this kind of like the, the guiding, the driving force, I would, I would call it that way, right? It's not the goal, but it's just the entire process that goes towards that, you know? So I think that we should, whenever it comes to creating this type of maps, I agree with, with what you said, Karen and Sarah, it's about more collecting those experiences, those stories, those faces of examples of this in our state uh, so that they can speak to it. So rather than giving anybody a recipe about, this is, this is an example of engaged citizen, rather, let me tell you a story about how I, you know, how I became an engaged citizen by doing X, Y, Z, right? That would turn, at the same time, an amazing opportunity for our students to showcase learning as well, not just in their local levels, but also at different levels that can speak to different audiences, whether it's students or administrators or a school uh, or, or superintendents, you know, but being able to have that opportunity to speak at different levels, you know, of all those experiences. Sorry, I am trying to make sense of everything that, but then try to listen to everybody and lots of thoughts are still in my mind about this. You know, I think the portrait of a learner, it seems to me like it's already so broad that uh, I could just think of a student's work fitting into all, if not multiple, but if not all of these. And so, um, I like the way that you said, Alfonso, about how a, a student might say, let me tell you how a story about, or let me tell you about how I became an engaged citizen. And then, you know, that would be an example, but we could all see as we listen to their story, how it, it also tells a story of a critical thinker, more like an effective communicator. So I think um, it lends itself to being open-ended and then um, it would be up to that student, teacher, whatever, to um, hone in on on that, but it, I feel like it's so open-ended that you can't really go wrong, but 
I mean, that's sort of how I see it. Not that it's easy, but that you can't really go wrong as, as far as finding a category um, and, and finding multiple categories, as it were. Thank you all. Karen, I'm being mindful of the time. I want to make sure the other two groups get some feedback too. Where we kind of left off as next steps for our group was um, we are being mindful of accessibility, knowing that we want a, a kind of a tool that will be interactive um, and folks will want to use it. Um, but we're also mindful that we need folks to be able to access it. And that means everyone. Um, and so we were going to do have some accessibility conversations, look at what tools we have available, um, and then work on drafting up a form that would collect the types of information that we're looking for. So um, I think what our group can work on in our time together, our, our smaller group can work on in our time together, um, is leaning more into this conversation that we've just had about capturing the stories, leaving it more open-ended. We are not necessarily the vetters of the experience, but more of the storytellers. Um, so I really think that's great feedback um, from you all and appreciate that. And I've written some notes for Penny, Carrie, and whoever might want to join us as we move forward. And if, if I can add, Sarah, how important is what uh, Ria said, right, about open-ended? Because instead of being prescriptive, rather we leave it up to the person that is in the very middle of the process to show this. Right. And not just that, I am thinking as well about how then that allows us as a group the flexibility to work within such as, for example, you mentioned accessibility, right? So I'm thinking about, for example, uh, uh, the part of our students, uh, the group of our students who are deaf, for example, the students who are English language learners, the students who have uh, disabilities or disabilities, uh, students who, you know, and, uh, who are in poverty, for example, right? And so on and so on and so on and so on. So uh, very good, Ria, saying that, you know, what open-ended, and I would push also for creating that door to accessibility that will allow us to not be too prescriptive and also not be constrained in the process of creating all of this. Thank you for emphasizing that. Um, so I think we can commit to kind of coming up with a draft of the types of information we would go out to gather. Um, and I had one follow-up question for the group, but it's lost on me. So if it comes back, I'll pop it in the chat, but I wanna make sure the other groups get time for some feedback as well. Thank you all. Um, I would really like to thank Alfonso for raising the issue, both um, Rachel and Carmen for raising the issue of the importance of how these things work together and the importance of telling the story. And then also, Alfonso, something that you said really resonates deeply with me, which is what we don't want to do is create a recipe here um, and turn this into a formulaic checklisty obligatory thing people feel like they have to do. Um, I would imagine that the Accelerating Innovation team is also grappling with questions like unintended consequences and keeping the spirit of the thing as you help turn, turn it into um, a, a requirement that people really do have to um, attend to for accountability. Um, I think those are deep questions that we should, those are the right questions, I think, for us to be grappling um, with. I'll tell you, we had a fair amount. I'd love to go next if we could uh, on, on our um, subcommittee, because we had a fair amount of conversation about that um, in our group. Um, and so I'm happy to just share a little bit of the conversation that we had. Our, our, our subgroup was about how to create entry points um, for folks and how to identify small shifts. Um, definitely want to give credit. Um, OVEC uses this language a lot about shifts in learning. Um, and so what we wanted to do was create um, not a, a, a place that is fully baked in a celebration of things that are already amazing. We wanted to speak to the people who thought, I'm not sure where to start, or I'm kind of doing some things, 
but I want to get deeper into it. Um, and so our standing committee um, or subcommittee is working on identifying what some of those small shifts are that anybody can reach for um, and, and use that as an entry point to deepen your practice. Um, so the intent um, is to identify some starting points for the design of vibrant learning experiences. We started to articulate a few of these things. Um, and um, we started talking about small shifts as being um, genius hour and passion projects and debates in class and um, experiments that kids can do that are authentic and flipping classrooms and um, doing a little multi-disciplinary uh, kinds of um, unit projects. And then we started talking about big swings, like bigger projects that are um, more swinging for the fences, like doing full-scale multi-week PBL units, um, kids having internships, like what we heard STEAM Academy talk about um, at the on the panel, kids doing community service projects, I mean, just et cetera. Like these are just a, a, a starting point of like, there's, there's a continuum here of small things to get started and then uh, bigger, more complex, longer term efforts that require more structural shifts um, in schools, structural changes in schools, um, but wanted to articulate that there's, you know, there are some small starting points for folks to get started. Um, and then we started talking about um, this idea that it whenever you're trying something new and innovative, there's a process here. Um, and the process is really um, cyclical and it's not just, it's certainly not linear, um, but folks um, really would try something and reflect on um, it through this process that we articulate as RISE and happy to work, continue workshopping this idea. But first of all, we, we were thinking of a teacher here is really kind of our, our um, target audience with, with this particular conversation. Reflect on what your current practices are. Think about an entry point. Try the entry point. Um, have the experience and then reflect on the experience. And what did you learn from it? And what good came out of it? And what was hard? And what would you change if you did it again? Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't checklist this thing and that we don't um, make a recipe for folks. We want people in the spirit of um, trying something, but we want to give them some ideas on, on where to start. Um, so um, that's one of the things that we talked about um, in our in our group. We talked about having actually, like this is a written statement, but we talked about having a lot of um, video testimonials from teachers who tried something um, and what the process itself was like, um, in addition to what was the entry point, but what was the process for trying something new in your classroom. Um, we talked about having maybe capturing stories from parents who saw learning that looked really different and what was their, um, how do they process through that? How do they support their kids in work that looks different than when we all went to school? We talked about um, capturing stories of students um, who, you know, were really used to one way of doing things and now are, are being asked to do work in a very different way and what's hard about that and what's rewarding about that and all those kinds of questions. So we also were a little bit getting into the business of um, not only identifying here are some things that you can do in a classroom or in a school, but also the, the process around that. Um, and that's really where we um, that's really where we left off, and I think where we began to cross over, Sarah, into the Canopy Project um, project. So I think um, one of the things we were thinking about was what's most important to capture here. Are we focusing on um, you know nuts and bolts and um, and details about these small shifts and big swings, and or the more messy process um, kinds of um, testimonials from folks. So that was one of the the, the questions that I would um, I would say that we were in the middle of grappling with when we sort of ran out of time there. Was there anybody else who was there for that conversation? Am I um, is there anything I'm missing from that standing committee subcommittee?
Um, so I would open the floor for that discussion if anyone is willing to wait on in there on that. The question is, should we just collect um, and, and put out into the world, here are some resources to help you with the small shifts and big swings, or should we also tell the stories that go with that um, of the people who have really done the thing? So I'm super curious to hear what everyone thinks about that. And I'll stop sharing so we can just talk. You know what, Karen, I think that personally, I think it's important to to hear from the person behind it, mm -hmm. because I think it, I mean, we've talked about you and I've talked about this. I think one of the things that that has really crazily been a barrier for the kind of learning experience we want for kids is to some degree PBL. And I say that only because if all teachers see is this incredible spread with the community partners and the, I mean, like that is awesome, but that does not seem like something I could do tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It's intimidating. It's intimidating. And so I think the stories really matter. Um, because I think that helps give the courage, you know, and for you to hear, look, I didn't know what I was doing. I took a chance, you know, that's no, that, that may be just me. So take it for what it's worth, but yeah. Yeah. It's like Rachel's, it's like agreeing. Rachel's agreeing. Uh, we, Rachel and I tend to agree. <laughs> Peanut butter, Peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Um, Alfonso. Um, all right, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm in the car, so I'm not sure if you all can hear me. Yes, we can hear you just right. fine. So um, for me, as much as detail-oriented I am, but I'm also thinking about who are we serving to with all of this? Like customers, right? If I'm gonna put some products out there for my customers to, to buy, I need to think about that audience. And I completely agree with Carmen in the sense that, that the students, those experiences should be the drivers of whatever it is that we are focusing on, right? Uh, additionally, at the same time, I would say as well that the soul, how to say, let's say that we put one experience of one student out there. I think that we should also capture the side story that goes along with it, as in, uh, as in how it impacted or affected the teacher, but also how it impacted or affected the, the administrator. And I'm saying this because uh, we are gonna do great in collecting all these stories, but in the process, we have heard many examples of administrators and teachers as well, who may not know very much, but they are willing to try. Men may want to do things, but they don't know how to navigate the process. They are frustrated because they are living in a system that maybe is, const is very constraining for them, but they are willing to try. I think that if we are able to collect those side pieces of the full story with the experience itself being the main driver of anything that we collect, not only we're gonna be able to capture what we want, but also we are gonna be able to cater to the agents in the system that are going to empower those students to have the experience that is gonna be recorded in those videos or those testimonies. Plus, at the same time, it would allow us to give some guidance for those teachers and for those administrators that they that they are, can also be active and important part of the entire process and not leave them behind, right? So instead of just putting out there one solution, let's try to include as many people as we can so that everybody can be an active agent of change. I agree. Um, it feels like we're coming to con some consensus around 
the 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 power of these things together resources and the human element of it both like the emotional and risk taking process and all of that um but also um um even more tactical elements of how to make the thing happen so um i'm i'm feeling like um a a thing to begin to consider is uh, we're, we're, we, we are about to embark on a significant data collection effort here. Um, and that's going to take some, I think, really intentional work on our part to identify what it is we're collecting, um, from whom we're collecting it, what is this, the story that we're telling, how are we um, putting this together in a package that is accessible to, um, including to Alfonso's point there, um, who's our audience for this. Um, this just feels like a significant data collection um, undertaking here. So um, I, we, we need, probably need to um, put some thinking into just logistics of that. Um, right, so. Karen, may, may I add, this is Rhea Eisenberg, that yeah. I, I don't know if it was said within my small group or the group as a whole, but there were, um, some who shared out that they thought it was important for certain schools, maybe even districts uh, who aren't as successful with assessments um, to possibly shine or do well um, with this, um, this um, vibrant learning and, and those um, artifacts and examples. So I wonder if it's important to maybe highlight some of those schools um, who may not traditionally perform well due to socioeconomic, um, you know, background and disabilities, things like that. So some of these uh, schools who traditionally do not perform as well, maybe we can find some schools who um, do well or have some great examples of this type of learning. Yeah, I love that. And I can add something from the accelerating innovation side of things, which is just that when we completed our last BHAG, it involved collecting a lot of data on examples from a variety of settings, both inside and outside of Kentucky. And we did ultimately create like a little worksheet that was very helpful. Um, now with the expectation that everyone's data collection takes the exact same form or that every part of it is applicable to every place that we look, but uh, having something like that was helpful. And I, I think safe to say, we're happy to share that if that would be useful. Yeah, I would love to see it. I think we all probably would. And we made, you know, personalize it to, to the VLE um, to the work, but we'd love to see it. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, okay, well, um, oh, hey, Holly, I see your hand up. Hey, I just want to say, like, I think as we're talking back to the map and then to hear your comments, maybe what we want to do is just have a map that has, like, people who have examples of the big hitters or just the small step, like maybe their stories, but that we also have maybe a link. I know in our subcommittee, we were working on criteria, maybe like a single point rubric. And so if you wanted to do the rise to give people a place to start, then they have the single point rubric where they could vet their activities and then they have the map where they can go and look at examples of, you know, this is somebody that started small and they found success. This is somebody that did something large. They found success. I could see districts that are finding success with the portrait work that they're highlighted on there as successful portrait work, you know, just call it what it is. Um, and then maybe it's a resource that as people start to think through that process, they have resources to go and vet their own work. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Just a thought. Um, the idea of like, what, what is our criteria? What are our criteria here? I think is a really important point, which also is a good seg to our next, um, to our next subcommittee. But I think important one, I think what part of what I heard you say that I think really matters is people being able to access the criteria and be able to sort of self-assess 
um, both in the sense of like, I'm not quite there yet, but also there are other folks who have self-assessed and, and they were putting themselves forth as just try this and to be able to access what they have to offer. Um, that feels like a powerful connecting and sharing point, which is this, this really the spirit of what we're trying to do, which is build more collaboration between schools and districts and teachers. And how can we do that less with the, uh, um, competition and more with collaborating um, between schools and districts. So uh, what a great idea and what a great um, segue over to the, our third uh, subcommittee, um, the evidence. Um, Justin, do you want me to share your slides or do you want to share something else or whoever is reporting for your? You can, you can share the slides. Okay. All right. Start talking. I'm pulling them up here. Well, I've got a lot of good people from my committee on here too. So I will just go over what we said on our slides and then anybody from my subgroup is welcome to join in and provide some other insight because he all had a lot of good things to say. So our kind of goals were to create a criteria for educators to follow that aligns with the full vibrant learning definition and can be used for self-evaluation as, as a resource for educators. There was a big discussion around um, if teachers should like be graded on this, who grades the teachers on this? Like, is there is this like a yes, you're doing this, no, you're not doing this? And we we kind of decided we wanted it to be more of a resource rather than a, a review almost, I guess you could say that. But um, teachers can look on like, look at what we put out and say, oh, I've, I've met some of these, you know, with this project or with this assignment that I just did. And then we could go into the map so where they would be able to submit that now that they see the criteria that they met. Another discussion we had was utilizing portrait of a learner to determine if a learning experience meets any aspects of the portrait of a learner. And so just, you know, most vibrant learning experiences are going to meet at least some aspect of a portrait of a learner. So we were talking about how we want to utilize the portrait of a learner within our um, goals here. And then um, was it Rader brought up the good point of what a classroom culture looks like with vibrant learning? Is it a safe environment? Is everybody involved? Um, those those kinds of things that I know a lot of you heard him talk about at the meeting. I, I can't do a good job of saying what he said, but that's kind of what he was what his um, focus point was. And then we want to break down the components and criteria of our definition, portrait of a learner components. And those are listed there, in addition to classroom climate, diversity, ethics, outreach, advocacy, et cetera. So that's my spill. Um, we're just basically looking for our criteria for teachers to be able to just use as their own resource, a personal evaluation, nothing that's going to put another strain on the classroom, because um, even as a student, I see how, how stressed and how busy the classroom is right now in this climate. So if anybody from my group wants to join in, go ahead. Um, can I ask a question? <clears throat> um, did you start articulating what the criteria might be or talk about maybe if anyone else had begun articulating what the criteria for your single point rubric, for example, like were you thinking of creating one or trying to find one out in the world that you um, customized or what were you thinking about that language? Um, I'm not sure of the terminology as just a student, but I think Travis and Susan Sintra and Holly, even you maybe talked about some other criteria that you wanted to base off of or take the floor. So to answer your question, Karen, we kind of pulled the state portrait of a learner and started to look at some criteria around what would be um, examples of vibrant learning experiences within the portrait. So if you are working on it, on something um, and it, you don't know if it's a vibrant learning experience, you could look at those criteria and see how you could bump your assignment one way or another to create a vibrant learning experience for your students. And it was all centered around that profile of a learner. 
and there is a doc, we do have a document that we were working on that on my phone, I'm not going to be able to find right now, but we do have that. <laughs> all good. It's all good. It's good. It's good to know that one exists and it started and interesting to hear about the alignment to the state portrait. Thank you. And I think we also talked about having the six portrait of a learner's um, uh, criteria um, in addition to what Justin said with the classroom culture and um, diversity and advocacy just sort of interwoven in there um, as either as separate pieces or within the portrait, the six pieces of the portrait of a learner, just to include all of the concerns within our group and within the better community of uh, the convening from that day, because there were a lot of concerns about culture and um, diversity and advocating for students and students being able to advocate for themselves as well as teachers. Um, we talked about aligning it to the Danielson framework, to the characteristics of highly effective teaching and learning so that administrators, if they want to use um, that as part of a, as an evaluation criteria, that that would already be out there for them in the world. They would, it wouldn't be something they would have to create, which might also encourage teachers to implement vibrant learning experiences in their classrooms. And I wonder if it could be stated instead of, you know, an evaluation, maybe just administrator feedback. Um, so that way the language, you know, speaks more to that we're helping create this culture instead of, I don't know, just evaluation. Some can be taken negatively um, by teachers. So just to keep, and maybe I'm just living in a utopian world, but maybe just sort of see it in the language of feedback um, might be helpful. Um, Sandy, is there anything in here like this to me is the most potentially crossover uh, one that has a, a lot of potential for crossover. Is there anything in here that we could do that would be helpful to your work um, on AI or um, vice versa? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think this is a good opportunity for collaboration for sure. Um, because it's still such early days over at AISC with our next BHAG, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like yet, but I, I have a feeling that if if accelerating innovation does go forward with the three models, like I was discussing, then knowing that this is what uh, is going on over at Vibrant Learning is going to be really helpful for guiding that work and, and figuring out kind of what to focus on. So mm -hmm. whether whether it's having a kind of liaison or uh, a separate meeting to for folks who want to collaborate. I definitely think there's a lot of overlap here. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you. I feel like what if we articulated as a team here, a full group, what we think our next steps are um, and just uh, committed to doing um, some things between now and our next meeting. Um, or beginning work on some of these things between now and our next meeting. Just proposing that as a as a, a next item for us to tackle on our on our learning journey here. Um, Sarah, I think you had articulated um, a few things you were thinking of for um, the canopy project or the map. Yeah, I think we could definitely work on um, getting some answers for what tools and platforms may be most accessible to us to build from, and maybe even putting together kind of a straw 
uh, or like a mock-up of what we're envisioning so that we can kind of input the data that we collect in into um, what we might possibly build. And then um, I think it's more dependent on the other subcommittees what that what that form looks like. We're just trying to wrap our heads around how we ask folks for the information. It's not just the information we want to gather, but how are we gathering it? Okay, that's good and helpful. Um, I think our entry points and small shifts, um, this is what I'm thinking, but you all tell me what else I'm missing. I would like us to think more about what those shifts are. I think we started a beginning of a list, but I don't think that is the full list of what some shifts are and some big swings, some entry points um, for folks and some big swings. Um, I think we can collect that from both research and from practitioners um, who we know have already waded in here. Um, I'd like to get a hold of that data collection worksheet that Sandy offered um, and to see what um, what might be um, customizable for us over here on the vibrant learning side of things. Um, I think we could start to identify a list of people commensurate with the small shifts and the big swings. We might be able to begin identifying some folks uh, who would be good uh, storytellers. So we might reach out maybe, I, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe to the co-ops. Um, NextGen knows some folks, but also the co-ops have a wider reach. Um, but um, I, I don't know, I'm thinking about that as a next potential step um, for entry points, but what else am I, what else am I missing? You guys are like, the more we say, the more we're going to have to do. Either way, it's a lot of work. Karen, offering up just a resource that'll be coming your way as soon as June 8th, and I will happily share with your subgroup as well as the whole group. The whole group. Um, um, we, we will have, there we go. Uh, we will have poster presentations for several districts across the state, mapping across the three big ideas of United We Learn at an upcoming presentation of learning. And so, you're like, well, those will be resources and tools that you all can lean on as well if it's helpful. It definitely is. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Karen, we are also glad to share, like if, if you all want to work with us on the, the deeper learning destinations that we've uh, featured, that's really what we're trying to focus on. So if it would be helpful to have some of those narratives with the kind of the simple shifts highlighted. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're welcome to anything that, you know, we think would be helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. That would be helpful. All right. This is Alfonso. Um, I would also suggest two things. One, uh, whenever we capture these voices, uh, please make sure that, that there is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There is an effort, a mindful effort to collect the voices of any of the multilingual learners that are in the state, uh, not just for the sake of, of sharing their experiences in their own language, but also because of the invaluable perspective that they provide whenever creating, whenever enjoying those experiences. And that I think that they would tell they would provide a layer, a different perspective whenever retelling those stories that otherwise we would not be able to record, to collect anywhere else. And on top of that, I would like also to say that a, a little bit of help on this in case if the regional cooperatives are not a, privy to that information, Perhaps uh, one good collaborator for us on this would be some of the uh, state professional organizations. Like for example, uh, there is this Kentucky World Language Association 
that is specifically for world languages. And uh, lately they have shifted, now that we are using this word, they have shifted to a specific initiatives in which they recognize the students for certain efforts. So perhaps because they are specifically working on that field, they may be able to capture stories. They may be our eyes and ears in the field, whatever they, whatever we cannot reach because that's not our circle of influence. So that would be also worth checking like Kentucky World Language Association or Kentucky TESOL uh, for ELL, ELLs. So yeah. I would put those names out there as well. Appreciate that. And I also appreciate the reminder about the eye to equity um, and making sure that all voices are being heard and held up here. Um, and um, yeah, I appreciate the reminder for sure. I think casting a wide net around folks who are already thinking about some of this or collecting some of this is gonna be helpful um, for sure. And then the other thing I just thought as you all were talking, I think we're gonna to have to find out about, like there are gonna be things that have already been collected that we're just curating, but there are gonna be things that we're gonna go out and collect. And what resources do we have to help us do that? So what are the video resources um, that are available to us? is just a legwork question that I feel like I need to um, do a little bit of running down on. So um, I appreciate you um, raising all of that. And then um, Justin, can you, did you hear next step kinds of things that you wanna identify for your um, subgroup? And then um, if there's nothing else for the good of all, you can close us out uh, since we're coming up on time here. Um, we definitely wanna keep working on our criteria and that you know form to be able to get out to y'all of what we're looking of what classifies as evidence for vibrant learning because I feel like that definitely is going to help Sarah's group and your group in your simple shifts how to get into what classifies as vibrant learning and then Sarah's group identifying where it is happening and with that being said um, we have a proposal for the next meeting date that we can throw out there June is a very busy month but June 21st is what, is what we can propose if anybody would like to raise any yays or nays on that. That'd be June 21st from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3.30 to 5 central time. We want to fist to five that, Justin. I see where Rashawn said he will not be available. Um, we can fist to five it in the chat. I'm also being mindful of now as well. We do have lots of folks who couldn't make it tonight um, for various reasons. Maybe uh, we also, we do have a fist. So maybe a doodle poll as well out to some folks. That's what I was about to say. I think a doodle poll sent out over email would be good for us. Okay, sounds like a plan. But also, I mean, summer is hard, right? It's just going to be... I mean, yeah. just about impossible to get everybody here in the summertime. Um, so I think we may just have to um, go with it, the majority, um, but we'll we'll send out a doodle poll to try to make sure we're really at capturing everybody as we possibly can. Um, so <laughs> Rashawn, was that a, um, <laughs> change my vote to a one. <laughs> Um, okay. All right. Well, that sounds like a good plan of action for us. Does anyone else have anything um, for the good of all before we close out for tonight? I, I, I have one thing. I, I think we should figure out a way to incorporate a small win so that we can see progress. Um, I think we've got a lot of big picture ideas that uh, 
aren't going to come to fruition for a long time. And um, we don't really want this project to just fall by the wayside like so many others. So we really should kind of try to implement some incremental milestones that not just not just for us, but for um, those that are expecting things from us. So just something to think on. An excellent point. Great idea. Okay, so we're going to send out a doodle poll and we're going to ask for ideas for small wins. That's what we're going to do. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I guess real quick, Karen sent out a VLE staff email yesterday. Did everybody, was it yesterday night? Mm-hmm. Last Did everybody night. That? Is anybody having trouble getting those? I guess that's our last thing that we can ask. Because <clears throat> I know like one was already spelled wrong. We mm -hmm. had to fix that when it first started. All right. Well, have a great rest of your week, everybody. And we are adjourned. Have a vibrant week. Have a vibrant week. Vibrant week. Yeah. All right. We'll at least I have finals, but everybody else try to have a vibrant week. <laughs> you too. Finals can be vibrant. <laughs>